For a minute, I didn't think it was going to take, but it did finally. So we are in 1 Corinthians. Um, last week was, was our crossing the threshold, turning the page from Romans to 1 Corinthians. And I was so excited to do that. We talked about the first nine verses in 1 Corinthians and how important those verses are for us to understand and for us to hold on to. Because as we unfold this book, this epistle, this letter, one of the things that we're going to see is um, the Corinthians are not acting like they are saved people. They're not living um, as if Christ is living in them. They're living very much in their flesh. They're living very much in the world. And as a matter of fact, if you left off the first nine scriptures of the entire epistle, you would think that these guys are not even saved. But what we read in the first nine verses is so very vital to the foundation that we know who are the Corinthians, who they are, who is Paul addressing here. And so it's important that we understand that, but it's also important that we understand that as it relates to us. So I'm going to just give a couple of bullet points through the first nine verses, and then we're going to move on. The, 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 the plan today is to go from verse 10 to 18. However, we may not make it that far, but we're going to see if we can. Um, but in the first nine verses, what Paul does in the very first verse is once again, authenticate who he is. And he says that he's a, an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. So it's not by his own doing. It's not by his own appointment. It's not by his own thoughts of who he is. It's through the will of God that he is who he is. And he taught, he addresses the Corinthians as the church of God. So who is the church, the body of Christ? He is telling them, you are the body of Christ. This is who he's talking to. And he also goes on to tell them they're sanctified, which we talked last week, that that is being set apart, declared holy, made legitimate. They are not illegitimate as the body of Christ. They are sanctified, which makes them legitimately the church, the body of Christ. And they are, he says to them that are sanctified, and this is in verse two, we're in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now that in Christ Jesus encompasses a lot. And we could pull out that little phrase right there and understand many, many things about who we are that are in Christ. One of the things that stands out the most to me about that is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is no condemnation for those of us who are what? In Christ Jesus. So when we put that and this together, he tells them they are in Christ. So as we unfold the rest of this, this epistle, we have to remind ourselves that even they are in Christ because it'll get a little muddy. It'll get a little cloudy. And we'll look at that and think, well, gosh, and I can tell you right now, churchianity would say to you that because of their behavior, they were not saved. But Paul is telling them right now, you're sanctified, set apart, made holy, made legitimate. You are in Christ Jesus. He says, grace be unto you and peace from God, our father. Well, later on in this book, we learn that the natural man receiveth not the things of God. So grace and peace from God, it, they, it comes from him. So if we're not in him, we don't receive those things. So Paul tells them grace and peace from God, our father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He thanks God for them. He says that in everything they are enriched by him in all utterance, in all knowledge, that even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, that is verse six, what is the testimony of Christ? The death, burial, and resurrection, that's the testimony of Christ, and he says that is confirmed in you. That's confirmed in you, and that is confirmed in me. That's a wonderful thing, um, and in verse eight, he says, who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that day? The day of our Lord, 
It's when he returns, when he comes to take the body of Christ to heavenly places, the rapture of the church. So the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, and Christ shall also confirm that testimony in you until the end, that you may be blameless. So it's the testimony of Christ that makes them blameless. It's the testimony of Christ that places them into Christ, their belief in that, their faith in that. And as we unfold the book, we are going to know that how is this possible? Because when we read about the things that they do, it's going to be questionable to us. It was questionable to me my whole life in church that um, I had salvation or I didn't have salvation. Uh, grace was conditional upon my performance, upon my behavior. Salvation was also conditional upon my continuance in perfection, basically. That's what was required for God to accept you, for God to uh, forgive you. Once you made that commitment, well, you had to keep it until the end. You had to remain faithful until the end. So we're going to read as we piece piece by piece what was happening among the Corinthians, and we need to remember these first nine verses. How is it possible that they would be in Christ, that they would be sanctified, that they would be called to be saints, that they would be identified with Christ? Verse nine is that answer, not because of their faithfulness, not because of their will, but it says in the first three words, God is faithful. That right there is the culmination of the how is this possible? How is it possible for you? How is it possible for me? How is it possible for my loved one to have seemingly walked away from what they know to be the truth? Because God is faithful. It's about what he does, not what I do. He says, God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now that word fellowship, I said last week, we're going to uh, look at that a little bit in more detail. Well, I just closed out what I was looking for. Um, this word fellowship, let me get it back up here because I should have written it down and I didn't think about writing it down until this morning. And I had it out here to write down, but then we started talking and I didn't write it down. But this fellowship, fellowship is a partnership. Fellowship is participation or intercourse. Fellowship is um, communion with. And then fellowship is also, he's gonna talk about being of the same mind that kind of like a unity. So fellowship is, um, is that, it's a joining together in commonality. Well, if I said that I want to be in fellowship with you, if I thought you had to be just like me, we would never be completely in unison because I'm gonna like things you don't like. You're gonna like things I don't like. Um, I'm going to like the color green. You're going to like the color blue. I'm going to like um, liver and onions. You're not going to like that. <laughs> you're gonna, I'm going to like things that you're not going to like. So if, if our relationship was dependent upon us being the same, it really wouldn't work. But this says that they are by whom ye were called. God is faithful, verse nine, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship, the joining together, the union of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So I want you to keep that in mind, that that fellowship means that union, that, that joining together with. And um, let's just move on from there. I'm going to read verses 10 through 18, and then we'll go to um, some commentary on that. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, 
but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. That which are saved is also a key phrase there. And now let's go back up. If you want to open your, um, your book to page six, I'm going to be talking about a little bit of that as we go along. Um, at the bottom, he starts commentating on verse 10. But when Paul says, now I beseech you in verse 10, he uses that word a lot. And we've talked about it in the past when it's come up, what that means. It's a strong urging, a desire that Paul has to, um, for them to fervently, not just, you know, well, maybe today I'll do this, or maybe tomorrow I'll do that. No, he, he, this idea of beseeching, I beseech you, brethren, is that you fervently do something. You pursue this. And so he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Well, remember verse nine, we're called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. When you and I get into fellowship, we can't think the same things if it's dependent upon you and then dependent upon me because we're separate. We have different opinions. We have different likes and dislikes. So we're separate. But this is calling them fervently to be uh, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that they all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. So this fellowship, the same thing, all these things kind of tie in together, kind of like um, when you're braiding somebody's hair, you're, you've got three strands, just a basic braid, you've got three strands, but yet you're putting them together to form something else, and then when you have that thing formed, they're in unison together, they're braided together, they're joined together, usually by a nice little rubber band at the bottom, <laughs> but this a little bit different. So, um, but he's saying that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So this idea of no division, worldly speaking, friendship speaking, there's going to be division. There's going to be, we're, because we're using our own flesh to make decisions. We're using our own flesh to have our likes and our dislikes, but there should be no divisions among brethren because we all have the same mind. And that mind is the mind of Christ. Uh, if you turn the page in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16, it says, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So the only way we can be in unison, in fellowship, joined together is to have that mind, the mind of Christ. And we have that mind here in the word of God. This is the mind of Christ. The only way I can get this mind to be in my mind is to read and believe it, to allow the word of God to truly renew my mind, to transform my thinking, that it come into agreement and in alignment with 
the mind of Christ. Not my opinion of it, not my thoughts about it, but truly the mind of Christ. And I've said many times before that, you know, I don't get that mind by um, laying my Bible on the shelf. I don't get that mind by putting my Bible under my pillow and sleeping on it. I don't get that mind by God just automatically opening my mind and downloading or depositing things in it. I can only exercise the mind of Christ as I read and believe, study his word. That's the only way I can build that mind within me. That's the only way you can build that mind within you. And when that happens, we are in fellowship with the same mind, the mind of Christ, not Patty's mind and Karen's mind, not Maria's mind and Karen's mind, but Patty using the mind of Christ, Maria using the mind of Christ, Karen using the mind of Christ. That is what joins us together. That's the fellowship that he's talking about right here. So there should be unity among the brethren. However, the unity must be in Christ. And he uses a scripture reference here that I, I did write down because I want to share it with you. Um, and I just touched on a little bit of it. How do we get this mind? We have to exercise in the word of, Christ, in the word of God. But Ephesians 4 verses 5 through 7 say this. There is one body and one spirit even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So in that little section of scripture, the word one, meaning one, um, Lord, I mean, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God is mentioned seven times. So we have to get that in us for us to be joined together. We're called unto that fellowship, that oneness with God. But we're also called as the body of Christ to experience that unity also because of that oneness that we have doesn't take away our individuality. It doesn't take away what we each bring to the table, so to speak. But when it comes to matters that he is going to be addressing with the Corinthians and that we need to address quite honestly, probably in our own personal lives, we have to have that oneness. And that only comes through the word of God. So when church denominations today, I'm on the bottom of page six, when church denominations today talk about unity, they are trying to do it in the flesh. This results in them not talking about doctrine at all because each denomination has their own carnal ordinances that match the fleshly desires of their congregants. And I thought about that statement for, for a bit and I kind of dissected it in my own thoughts. Everybody comes to the table and instead of sitting the, at the table with the Bible, the word of God as the centerpiece, we come with all of our ideas. And this is very common. We come with all of our ideas and all of our thoughts and all of our opinions, rather than letting the scripture speak and say what the scripture needs to speak and say to us so that we can be rooted in the sound doctrine. The sound doctrine is the same. It doesn't change. It's denominationally changed from church to church or house to house, however that may be, based on your own personal interpretation. Well, my personal interpretation is based on my flesh. I cannot do that. I have to read and believe God's word, whether I understand it or not, know that the word of God also tells me that as I do that, I will have understanding in all things. I'm gonna bring that scripture out in just a little bit. So therefore, unity among men results in the absence of sound doctrine. I'm going to say that again. Unity among men results in the absence of sound doctrine. Why? Because it's rooted in opinions and feelings, emotionalism. Uh, while unity in the body of Christ results in unity around sound doctrine. 
So rather than us all coming to the table with an idea or an opinion, we need to come to the table with the sound doctrine that comes from the word of God. Now, we talked a little bit last week in our conversation time about different translations of the Bible. And he gets into this a little bit later, but I'm just gonna say this little nugget. When we come to the table with all of these different translations, we don't really have one true sound doc. They're all different. They may change a slight. And what does the word tell us about the slight of man? It's deceptive. That is, that's the same thing with different translations. It's the slight that is deceiving. And it is, it is done ultimately by Satan because he doesn't want you. He doesn't want me to come into the knowledge of the truth because that is when I experience the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. The freedom to say, you know what? When I die, I'm gonna be in heavenly places. I don't question that. I don't doubt that. But there was a day in my life that Ronnie Allen would come home every day and I would be sitting on the porch. We had a little swing on the porch. I would be sitting on the porch and I would be crying, just rocking back and forth, just crying because I thought, I'm going to hell. I'm causing everybody in my family to go to hell because of my decisions. Boy, I had some power, didn't I? And, but yet that was grievous to me because that was the truth in the moment of what I was taught. Until one day Ronnie said, look, we, you know, because I'm gonna tell you how far this went. This went as far as me saying to myself and wrestling within myself, how can I leave him to free him from this sinful person so he can have a chance to go to heaven. This is how twisted. We just had tornadoes come through Texas day before yesterday. And some of my dear friends that are south of me um, experienced devastating losses in this tornado. Well, let me tell you something. The most devastating loss that we can experience is a tornado spiritually that twists you up inside so much and leaves nothing but destruction in its, in its wake for you to not be secure, absolutely sure of who you are in Christ. Now, Paul spent nine verses to tell the Corinthians, this is who you are. He's telling them, but now he's gonna start doing some things or saying some things that's gonna make them start thinking, wow, this is who we are. We need to start acting like who, who we are because we're not acting like that. When I sat on my porch every day crying, thinking I was doomed and causing all these people to be doomed right along with me, you know, I just had a, a basket full of people in my, in my basket that I was responsible for, and I was taking them all to hell. That's what I thought. And um, that's not the place we want to be. We want to be absolutely sure and let the word of God be richly revealed in our life through Christ in us. That was the lie of Satan over me. And I believed it. I bit that bait hook, line and sinker. And I was going down with the ship on it. I'm telling you, we don't want to do that. So we want sound doctrine. Philippians 127, I wrote this down as a little reference. Like I said, we cannot always agree. We're not always going to agree on things in our personal life, but yet we can be best friends. Hey, we can go have lunch together and I can order liver and you can order steak and we can still be friends. Isn't that cool? Because we can think different. We can like different things. We can do different stuff. But when it comes to the mind of Christ, this is what Philippians 127 says. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast, here's this word one again, in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So when, when Paul is addressing the Corinthians in the epistle that he wrote to them here that we have recorded, he's even addressing us. 
we need to be of the same mind and that mind needs to be the mind of Christ when it comes to these things. Our conversation needs to be reflective of that, that our character, you know, I used to ask my kids the question, if something were to happen to you today, what do you want the first thing that comes up in somebody's mind? What do you want that first thing for them to think of about you? Well, at the time, you know, my kids were little and, you know, um, I did teach them to love God. I did. And so that was the first answer they both gave. Well, I, I would want them to know me as somebody who loved God. Okay, that's great. I felt victorious as a mom, let me tell you, when they said that. I felt really, really good. And then they said, um, you know, I want them to, to think I'm a good person. I want them to all this and that, all good things. Well, I say this to you. What do you want that one thing? Paul tells us, just told us in 1 Corinthians that he may hear that they are of one mind, one spirit, that he may hear that. So that's what he wanted to hear about people. That's your character. I just thought that was a really neat little tidbit. So verses 11 through 13, 1 Corinthians 1, 11 through 13. Paul starts addressing something very serious here that we need to get. You probably all already have it. I'll just be honest, but I didn't have it. I had to really think about this and get this. Now, over the last two plus years, it's become more rooted in me. But at when I'm sitting on my porch, rocking back and forth, crying every day, I didn't get this. And he says this for it has been, it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, declared unto me. He had heard, okay? He had heard this about them, uh, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you bat were ye baptized in the name of Paul? So the Corinthians problem is like they, like churchianity today, has carnal divisions. There's contentions, like sandpaper rubbing sandpaper. There's contentions there. And that comes from the flesh, those carnal divisions. That's not being in fellowship with. Jesus Christ. And that's what they're called unto that fellowship, not to exercise the fleshly mind, but to exercise the mind of Christ, that they come into agreement through that. They were following people rather than following God's word. We're on page seven. There are four divisions listed here. And these same divisions can be seen today in churchianity, which shows that there is nothing new under the sun. There's no new thing under the sun. You know, um, a lot of times this day and time, you'll hear things about the new age, the new age religions, the, you know, new age. Well, I happen to believe the word of God when it says in Ecclesiastes that there is no new thing under the sun. So the new age that we hear about today is really the resurgence of that which is old age. Because these religions, these practices, all of these things have been around. So it's just the new age is the return of the old age. So that's what I kind of see. But here we have these four divisions, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, and Christ. And years ago, when I would read that, is Christ divided? Well, I thought there was a right answer there. I thought in, in verse 12, when he gives these four divisions and he says, an eye of Christ, well, I'm thinking, well, that's the one I want. I want to be of Christ, right? Because that's the right one. Um, not the others. I want to be of that one. We're going to break that down in a minute. And it's astounding. So is Christ divided? I thought, no, Christ isn't divided. And I want to be of him. Was Paul crucified for you? No, Paul wasn't crucified for me. Christ was crucified for me. Now, this is where when Paul gives us the instruction to study, 
to show ourselves approved unto God. And then at the end of that, rightly dividing, this is where that kind of gets a little bit of a hammer because um, Paul tells us to follow him as he follows Christ. And so, but it, when we come to an understanding of these four divisions and how to relate them to where we are today in churchianity, um, you, it's gonna come clearer to you as well, I hope. So, I am of Paul. What does that mean? You heard of the grace card? You know, it's like the Monopoly board where you get the get out of jail free card and you kind of tuck it right there for the time you get put in jail and you can play that card and get out of jail free. Well, grace is used as that type of card for those who say, I am of Paul. And, and this is what they're saying. I am of Paul. It may sound like a good thing to follow Paul. After all, he is the apostle of the Gentiles. And he talks about that in Romans eleven thirteen. 13. But before that, Christ commissions him to be the apostle of the Gentiles, and that's in Acts. Just three chapters later, after Paul tells you that he is the apostle of the Gentiles in Romans 11, he says, I beseech you, there's that word again, beseech, urge you to be fervent in this, be ye followers of me. However, here he asks the question, was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? These questions, Eric says, lead me to believe that the Corinthians were putting Paul on a pedestal. As the apostle of the Gentiles, Paul magnified his office. And that's what Romans eleven thirteen says. If you turn back a few pages in your Bible to Romans 11, we'll read that. For I speak to you Gentiles, in as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. He doesn't say there, now put me on the pedestal. Now bow down and worship me. He doesn't say that. What he says at the end of that verse is, I magnify my office. So Paul is in no way wanting praise. Paul is in no way wanting glory. Paul says, I, I'm this, but magnify the office, not me. Magnify the office. So given that the Corinthians were carnal, those who said that they were of Paul um, probably were using the eternal security that Paul taught as their license to sin, that grace card. Paul gives us grace. Uh, or brings grace of God. I'm going to I'm going to be of him because I get to have fun, eat, drink and be merry, have fun. I'm going to use that. I want to be I want to follow him. Today this would be the seeker friendly mostly mega church. I have friends, acquaintances that are parts of these huge mega churches in the the Conroe Houston area, which is big area. I'm about an hour and a half from from there, maybe two hours exactly from Houston, but um, there are huge mega churches. Joel Osteen's church is in Houston. Huge mega churches in that area. Seeker friendly. You can find what you're looking for. You can find a version of the Bible that says it the way you want to hear it and you want to live it. You can get your card stamped like I shared the passport. You can get your passport to heaven through those churches, but it's really not worth the the paper it's printed on if they give you a paper for it. But that would be the, the seeker-friendly mega church today. I am of Paul. So what's the next one? I of Apollos. Well, let's talk about Apollos, Old Testament law keepers. I of Apollos. Acts 18.24 describes Apollos as a Jew who was an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. We're talking about a man who knew the law, okay? Aquila and Priscilla took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. That's Acts 18, 26, which I take to mean that he knew the Old Testament really, really well, but he didn't know the mystery. He would not have been one that says, I'm gonna be a Paul because he was more of a law keeper. 
Apollos was at Corinth, and we'll get to him being at Corinth later on in the epistle. Um, but for a time, and so those who say that they are of Apollos were probably Old Testament law keepers. What does that look like to you and me today? When we're looking at the church on every corner that has a different name, a different doctrine, a different statement of faith, what does that look like today? This is the legalistic church. This is the church that resembles Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Church of Christ, and others who require you to do works to maintain your salvation. Remember rocking on the front porch crying? That's what I was locked in, a very legalistic, um, law-keeping church. So that would be Eye of Apollos. So you got, a, you got a choice here at Corinth. You can say you're of Paul and you can pull out your grace card or you can say, well, you know, I'm a little scared of that. So let me be of Apollos. I'm going to be more of the law keeper because that is where I feel safe. That is where I feel comfortable. But that's not what we need to be. Then the next one, I of Cephas. Now, who is Cephas? Cephas is Peter. Who is Peter? The apostle to the Jews. So remember that. So you've got here at Corinth, I am of Paul, I of Apollos. And now he's talking about the third division that was all in this house of Chloe, I of Cephas. So more of a Peter follower, which is the tongues and the miracles. Cephas is Peter. The Lord Jesus Christ placed Peter in charge of the little flock of Israel upon his ascension to heaven. Ten days later, the Holy Ghost was given, and the little flock all spoke with other tongues. That's in Acts 2, verse 4. They also had the power to perform physical miracles. Mark 16, verses 17 through 18. And I can tell you, I have, I've camped out in Acts 2. And I've camped out in Mark 16 in my walk. Since Peter was over the little flock, those who say uh, they are of Cephas probably got into the tongue talking and miracles. And we're going to talk about that as we unfold in the book of Corinthians, because there's a lot of things for us to understand about that. But as we get to um, tongues and miracles, those kind of things. It's going to be in chapter 12 through 14 of this book. That tells us that there was a lot of tongue talking going on in the Corinthian church. Today, who would be those who uh, follow Cephas? It would be more Pentecostal. It would be more full gospel, charismatic churches. So then the fourth, which is where I thought we were all supposed to be, we were all supposed to give the answer I am of Christ. I am of Christ. That's the red letter adherence. And I mean no disrespect when I say that because the red letters are important. All right, I'm getting a little notification here. There we go. Um, red letter adherence. I of Christ. As with Paul, this group seems like a good thing. Okay, we're going to be Paul with grace. That's good. And then let's be eye of Christ with Christ and follow what he says in the red letters. After all, Paul will later tell the Corinthians to be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. That's in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Yet Paul asks the question here, is Christ divided? Indicating that these people have different ideas of what following Christ means. They're probably following Christ's instructions. That would be a red letter adherent as seen in Matthew through John. The problem is that because those instructions are to Israel at the at hand phase of the kingdom, and that kingdom has now been put on hold, Christ's instructions in the gospels do not agree. They're not in unison with Paul's instructions today. Moreover, there are instructions that Christ gave, such as in Luke 12, 33, sell all that you have. Is that not red letter in your Bible? 
It is in mind. Sell all that you have. That ye, that the carnal Corinthians did not want to follow. So they wanted to find one of the other three categories to fall into because who wants to sell all that all that they have, you know, and give to the poor or share or live like that? Who wants to do that? We work hard for what we have, right? So who wants to do that? So therefore, those who would say I of Christ were picking and choosing which of Christ's commandments in Matthew through John they wanted to follow, which had created divisions. Now, who do those people look like today? If we were to look at those people in all of these categories, who do they look like today? They are the major Christian denominations, such as Catholics, Baptists, Methodists, Lutherans. And I happen to agree with that, that statement. When you look at each, each section, each division here, and you break it down that way, you can see in very clear vision exactly those things. So they follow the red letters of Jesus, but only those commandments that each of them like, which results in different denominations. For example, I told you that I had camped out in a couple of places. I had camped out in Acts 2, 38. What shall we do, therefore? Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. That's why I had multiple trips to the baptistry because I obviously was still in sin. You know, it didn't take for me. But I also camped out in Mark chapter 16. And I'm saying, I'm going to bring this out just to point out that people pick and choose which commands in red letter they want to follow and which commands they don't. So Mark chapter 16, if I can ever get to it, Verses 17 and 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Let me tell you something. I've been in the audience, in um, fellowship with people who will say in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave this person. I command this. I command that. So they want to do that. In, the, in, the, in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Want to do that too. I never saw a serpent. It says they shall take up serpents. I never saw a pastor bring a serpent to church to prove this point. Never saw that. So there we go cherry picking. I want to cast out the devil. I want to speak in new tongues. I want to do those things. Why? Because they draw attention to who? me, me, they pedestalize me. If I can do this, look at all these people that will be brought to me, but maybe I won't bring that serpent. So I'm going to just, you know, erase that red letter. I don't want to bring that, but it says here that they shall take up serpents. Here's another one that they don't want to do. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. So those two things, taking up serpents and bringing a bottle of liquid plumber to the church, they're not going to do that. Why? Because they truly don't believe. If they believe that they can cast out a devil to the point that I've seen people writhing in vomit at an altar through emotional onset, they believe they can do that. Why wouldn't God confirm that ministry in them to take up a serpent and drink a deadly thing. But they don't do that. You will not see that. Or if you do, you're going to be calling 911 in the service because that's just what's going to happen. So those two things we've erased out of the red letters. It shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So in those two scriptures, the signs that shall follow them that believe. They want to do a few, but there's two that they want to take out and set over the side just in case, you know, just in case that one's not true. Well, if God would use you, did he use the apostles to do those things? He absolutely did. But 
what he did with them, he's not doing with me. How do I know that today? Because I have been called unto the fellowship of the mind of Christ. So in order for me to understand the word of God, the way I'm supposed to understand it, the way the Holy Spirit would have me to understand it, there's no way around rightly dividing the word of truth. Not going through with our, our big equipment, cherry picking things that we want to do. That's not the word of God. And that's what Paul is telling them. Is Christ divided? So he goes on to say, we should be Bible believers. Just forget about the term rightly dividing, although you can't forget about it as you unfold the, the word because it's there. But believe the Bible and trust God in every point that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So all scripture, I discard none of it. But when those things come into it, it's either all true or it's not. So if I'm going to follow Cephas and say, I am of Cephas, it's either all true or it's not, guys. I'm either going to pick up the serpent and drink the liquid plumber or I'm not. It's either all true or it's not. Don't do that, by the way. I love all of you and I don't want to lose any of you. <laughs> so don't do that. But believe the Bible. Believe it as it unfolds, even when you don't want to. Even when you think, I really liked it better when I was over there because I liked all that. I liked all that excitement. I liked all that. Make the decision that you're going to believe the Bible because it is freeing. No more do I sit on my porch on a swing and cry because I think I'm going to hell in a handbasket and taking my family with me. No more do I look for ways to be loopholed into being able to go to heaven. No, no more do I do that because why? My confidence is not in me, but it's in the completed and the finished work of Christ. So we should be Bible believers. Following God's word, rightly divided. First, we consider what Paul says. Then the Lord will give us the understanding of how the rest of the Bible applies to us. I'm going to bring this scripture out. I said earlier I would bring it out shortly, and it is 2 Timothy 2.7. So when you go to 2 Timothy 2.7, if you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, highlight it, because it's a big one for us to understand today. This is our apostle speaking to us. He says, consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. Does that happen all at one time? It didn't for me. It certainly didn't. But as the will of God in 1 Timothy 2, 4 is that every man be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth, that is the Holy Spirit, the Lord, giving the understanding in all things. When that wire gets connected and the electricity goes on, it's like, wow, now I understand why I believe it. Why do I understand it? Because the Holy Ghost in me discerned it to me. That's why. 2 Timothy 2.7, understand that scripture because that is very, very important. So as such, we are following God's word rather than following man's interpretation of God's word. That's not man's interpretation. That's what God says because it is God we answer to on judgment day, not man. Remember earlier on, it was brought out that unity among men results in the absence of sound doctrine, while unity in the body of Christ results in unity or fellowship around sound doctrine. Very, very important. important. 
So that brings us to verse 14, right? Yes. Now, Paul goes on here in verses 14 through 17, and really I kind of lumped 18 in there too, but 14 through 17, and he talks about water baptism. And this is another interesting thing. I had to truly let the Holy Spirit discern this to me. One of the first, if not the first, um, rightly divided Tuesday night study, May the 5th, 2020. It was either May the 5th or the next week. I had a question because I was a big water baptism. That was the mark of your salvation was if you had been in the water, period. And if you had not been in the water, you didn't have salvation. Every Sunday we would have, don't let yourself walk out that door before you get baptized. Because in the denomination or the church that I was in, that was the mark of your identity. But Paul says, okay, what have I learned since then? A lot. But I asked the question of Eric, well, if we're not supposed to be baptized, then why was Paul baptized? Because he was baptized. And that, like I said, May the 5th, 2020, or the week after that, in the Q&A, and you will hear an extensive answer that completely cleared that up for me. But if that answer didn't clear it up for me, this does. 1 Corinthians 1, 14 through 17. I thank God, Paul says, that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanas. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Verse 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So those verses right there, if the doctrine of water baptism is for today. And Paul to Paul was revealed the mystery that was kept secret since the world began. Wouldn't Jesus say to him, now, Paul, when I send you out as this apostle, the one who is sent, you better make sure that you get everybody in the water because that is what's going to be the mark of who they are in me, that I have been approving of them. Wouldn't that be what Christ gave him the instruction to do? If that is where salvation is found in the water. But Paul says, I wasn't sent. And who sent him? Jesus did. Those who say I am of Christ. Well, in the ministry of Jesus Christ, there was water baptism because that ministry was to the Jew. And that was a requirement. But then he sends Paul to us. And that's no more a part of how we get our passport to heaven. Those who were on for the conversation uh, before we started will understand what I'm talking about there. So I can remember Paul telling us way back in Romans chapter one, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. He doesn't say to everyone that believeth and is baptized. He says to everyone that believeth that the gospel, and what is the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord, for the atonement of our sin. That's the gospel. That is the power of God unto salvation. It's not me going up the aisle and getting in that water before the door closed on Sunday morning. Although I thought that, and when I was a teenager, I really thought that, and I thought every time I let that day pass, that was my only opportunity. Lord, please don't let me die. Lord, please don't let something happen to me before next Sunday, because maybe I'll have the courage to walk the aisle next Sunday. And the next Sunday would come, and guess what? I didn't have the courage. Why? 
Because remember me telling you guys that I was a little first grader who sat in my chair, my desk, and I would write with my pencil until the lead was completely flat because I didn't want people to see me get up and go to the pencil sharpener. That is how shy I was. You really couldn't tell that today, but that is how shy I was. When it came to that day, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, that plea to the congregation was given every single service. We don't want an opportunity to pass you by. If you've not put on the Lord in baptism, don't walk out that door until you've done that. And every service, I would walk out that door until I turned 17. And when I turned 17, I was water baptized for the first time, day after Christmas, 1982. I'll never forget that day. But now I'm to a place in scripture that is to me. And I'm understanding that the water didn't make one bit of difference, not one bit. So churchianity does not want to hear that. Because water baptism, and Eric says it, this is his word, uh, water baptism is their sacred cow. They want to water baptize you so that they can get you to serve Christ in the flesh. Doing that is, and some churches will say it's an outward manifestation of an inward work of grace. I'm circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. You can't see that. I can't see that, but yet I believe it. If I've got that, why is it necessary that you see me walk an aisle for your own peace of mind? That, okay, I can identify with her because now she's saved. In my church, we took communion every Sunday, the bread, the cup, cracker and the juice. And when I was a kid, I was not privileged to take that because it was only the mark of water baptism that took you from sinner to Christian. And once I became a Christian at 17, according to the church, then I could partake in the Lord's Supper, the cracker and the juice. That's a whole nother story. But Water baptism is a way to get you to serve Christ in your flesh. And that's not what the Lord is wanting. Churchianity either teaches that water baptism is required for salvation, or they believe it should be done, like I said, as that outward manifestation of an inward work of grace. Remember me talking about the passport, the, the, the sinner's prayer on the back of it, and all of that? Well, that the latter, an outward manifestation of an inward work of grace, find that in here for me. If you find it in here for me, I will believe it. And I will get on board with that doctrine. But it's not here. It doesn't say that. Remember, unity among men results in the absence of sound doctrine. That's part of that. That is part of that. So that is not found anywhere in scripture. While the former baptism being a part of salvation is only found during the at hand phase of the kingdom for Israel's program. So water baptism today is a way of churchianity calling you into obedience. That's what we always called it. When you got baptized, water baptized, you were obeying the gospel. That's not the gospel. Not for today. Nowhere in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, do you see water baptism? Nowhere there. Without putting a place marker where the at-hand phase of the kingdom was set aside, where Israel was set aside, without putting a place marker there, we just bring all of that into all of this, and then all we've got is a bunch of muddy water. Nobody knows what to do. So we have the absence of sound doctrine. We unify 
through the mind of Christ, which is found in his word. And we exercise that mind every single time we open the word of God, we read it and believe it, even when we don't understand it, because 2 Timothy 2, 7 says that the spirit will give it or that the Lord will give us understanding in all things. Why? Because God wants us to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Man, when I started putting these things together, it was like bolt cutters, breaking, just cutting the chains, the shackles off of me. What a blessing. What a blessing. So he goes on, on page eight in our commentary. Well, I made myself a little note in the dispensation of grace. When we went from prophecy to mystery, we have crossed the threshold from physical, physical things, physical obedience to spiritual. We are saved by grace through faith, not walking that aisle, not getting wet. As a matter of fact, um, water baptism is only recognized by your peers because it's not a requirement of God. So he goes on at the end of page eight, and he kind of breaks down some things about water baptism. And he says in there that when John the Baptist came on the scene, he said to repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so what did he also say? That he baptized with water, but that one would come after him whose sandals he was not fit to tie. He would baptize a different way. The reason they needed to repent was due to the apostate apostasy of Israel. God was forming his own nation of Israel. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Who is the you? The Jewish religious leaders and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof, which would be the believers of Israel, Israel's believers. That's Matthew 21 verse 43. The ones aligned with the religious leaders get this. So when I want to say I am of Paul, I of Apollos, I of Cephas, and I of Christ, when I want to align myself with one of those, today it might be Catholic, it might be Baptist, it might be Methodist, it might be Mormon, it might be Jehovah Witness. If I want to align myself with one of those divisions, because all of this is division, this is what the red letter edition says. The ones aligned with the religious leaders are called generation of vipers. Do you want to be aligned with that? In unity, in fellowship with that? They cannot escape the damnation of hell. That's Matthew 23, 33. The new Israel of God, which is talked about in Galatians 6, 16, ends up being the little flock who believe the gospel, Luke 12, 32. They must also be water baptized, both to save themselves from the untoward generation of vipers and to be ordained as priests to reach the Gentiles for God. When? During the millennial reign. This is why both Jesus in Mark 16, 16 and Peter in Acts 2.38, which is where I grew up in Acts 2.38, said that water baptism was required for salvation. It's not to you and it's not to me, lest Paul would not be thanking God that he only saved a few people if water baptism was the requirement, because he just said he thanked God he didn't baptize many of them. Once Israel is saved, Romans 11.26 in their kingdom program, they are to go out to the Gentiles as a kingdom of priests. You and I are not going to be that kingdom of priests. We are not spiritual Israel. Israel is going to be the kingdom of priests. And they will go out as that kingdom of priests during the millennial reign of Christ. Gentile salvation is the whole purpose of the millennial reign. Otherwise, eternity would begin at the second coming of Jesus Christ. When Israel did not believe the gospel, God set that program aside and started the dispensation of grace. I loved that Eric put the reference here because sometimes I have people ask me the question, 
Well, when did this happen? And it's in Acts 9, verse 23. The things of Israel's program were a shadow of things to come. I know you've probably heard types and shadows. This is a type of Christ. This is a shadow of the body of Christ or whatever. So um, the things of Israel's program were a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. That's Colossians 2.17. Therefore, water baptism was a shadow of the dry baptism the Spirit performs on you today into Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Just like you are spiritually circumcised today and not physically circumcised, you are also spiritually baptized. We read earlier in Ephesians, Four, verses five through seven, that there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So who is the one who baptizes today in the dispensation of grace? Spirit, the Holy Ghost. You are baptized by the Holy Ghost. And there is nothing that has to manifest in you for that to happen. You believe the Word of God. You trust in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the atonement for your sin. And you are baptized with the one baptism that is taught in the scriptures for us today. And that is by the Holy Ghost. So we are spiritually baptized today, not physically baptized in the water. You may say, why then did Paul water baptize some people? This is a good question. And it's one that deems answering. The reason is because through Israel's fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. We covered that in Romans 11, 11. Just like speaking in tongues was a gift to Israel in Acts 2, but the body of Christ spoke in tongues before God's word was completed. 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, water baptism also relates specifically to Israel's program, but some members of the body of Christ were water baptized before God's word was completed. You know, I look back, at my own um, journey and the things that I did in my flesh, I thought were the right things. And, and I praise God for his grace because that's what grace covers. When we have a fervency, Hebrews tells us that the Lord is a, a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When we are diligent and we are seeking him, there are things that we do, like water baptism, that we later learn as we come into the knowledge of the truth. Well, you know what? We didn't have to do that. And I would never teach somebody today that you have to do that because I know better. Remember me saying earlier, you can't unknow what you know. And when you know what you know, you can't help but share it rightly. That's just the way it is. Well, I want to move on to this um, verse 18. And I want to close with it. It says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Um, the cross, I would encourage you on page nine to finish reading the commentary there. There's a lot of good information, uh, more about water baptism. And if you have more questions about that, we can certainly talk about that in our conversation time. I'll just close that little section to say we should note from verse 17 that God does not save people by wisdom of words. He saves them by the preaching of the cross. So that's why Paul was not sent to baptize. 
And then Paul goes on to say, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The cross is the dividing line of the world today between heaven and hell. The bottom line, if you trust in Jesus's death on the cross for atonement of your sins, you're going to go to heaven. If you do not, you're going to go to hell. That's a pretty black and white statement right there, but it is the truth. The cross offends the unbeliever, Galatians 5.11 tells us. But it says that you are, because it says that you are a sinner bound for hell and there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. That's pretty offensive, I would say. So um, your flesh, actually, um, God had to send his son to die on a cross to pay for your sins. Your flesh does not want to let go of its religious pride, thinking that it can do something to save itself. I can do something to save myself. And when we say that, or when we fall in alignment, get into fellowship with that type of mindset, we are saying that what Christ did was not enough. And there is more of a requirement for me. I don't want to say that. I, I honestly don't. I did say that at one time because I thought it was truly up to me. Sitting on that porch crying every day, it was up to me. I needed to leave my husband. I needed to try to make it on my own. I needed to set the people free that I obviously was causing to go to hell. How twisted was that tornado, spiritually speaking, in me? It was pretty twisted, pretty twisted. Eric says here on page 10, um, your flesh does not want to let go of its religious pride, thinking that it can do something to save itself. This is why there are world religions. People usually fall in to, to one of two categories. Sin and don't care, thinking that there is no God. That's the knowledge of evil. Or sin and think religion will save them. Religion being the knowledge of good. The cross shows man that you must be in category three, which is to trust in Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins. That's the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, three through four, in order to go to heaven. For all those in the first two categories, the preaching of the cross is foolishness. It's absolutely foolish. For those in the third category, it is the power of God to save them from hell. Now remember Romans 1, 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. We should note that most modern versions here, I told you when I read in verse 18, that a key phrase in there is which unto us, which are saved. That is a key phrase. And most modern virgin, versions change that to uh, that us, which are saved to us, which are being saved, thereby introducing Satan's lie of conditional salvation. And Eric lists a number of translations there that do that. Um, and that is a satanic change. We are saved. It is something that has already happened. It has already taken place. I'm a visual person and I made myself a little chart and I put the cross here in the middle. And I'll take a picture of this and send it to y'all on the email. And I put the great divide because he says the cross is what divides the world today between heaven and hell. So on this side of the cross, I put those things that basically churchianity represents. To them that perish, this is foolishness, okay? But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. On this side, if the cross is foolishness to you, you're bound for hell. You either believe in the completed work of Jesus Christ or you don't. Remember we said that earlier when talking about those gifts? You either believe, if that's what you're going to subscribe to, you either do it all or, or none. 
So you're hell bound if you're on this side, but you're heaven bound on this side, that this is enough. What happened here is enough, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The cross either offends you or it humbles you. As I was doing this and I was writing it, I was tearful because when I think about what the cross means, what it represents to me, and all I have to do is believe it. And then as I choose to believe it, I don't even live by my flawed faith. I, my faith is exchanged for the faith of Christ, and that is the faith I live by his, not mine, his faith. So I'm either offended or I am humble. Religious pride, talking about that, I'm either self-confident I'm boastful, I'm arrogant, or I trust God, not religion. You know, I had a pastor that wore a suit and a tie all the time. And he stated that people had asked him, why did he do that? Because this day and time, you know, most pastors are up there in their blue jeans and their little button down that maybe open at the top or even a, a pullover polo or whatever. Why do you wear a suit and a tie all the time? It's hot, it's confining, it's all of that. He said, because it depicted who he was in Christ. And what he said was, I am no longer a servant. And he put his hands right here on his jacket and pulled it and said, but a son. Does that sound prideful? I don't believe that... I, I don't believe that I'm going to have a mansion on a hilltop here in this, on this earth. I don't believe that God's promotion of me is going to be seen in the way I dress or where I live or how many dollar signs I have in the bank. I don't believe that God re, God's rewards are that way. If we do believe that, we need to read more into the Apostle Paul. Because if anyone was deserving in the mind's eye, in the flesh mind, it would have been Paul to not have struggled for what he did, for what he brought to us. But his life was far from that, far from that. We're either going to trust in that, in that religion, which is going to be performance-based. It's up to me. It's up to me. Or we're going to be on this side. We're going to trust in God, not religion. And I was reminded of Philippians 1, 6. Our confidence is in him. He is the one that performs, not us. So it's either up to me or it's up to thee. I'm going to say that based on these first 18 verses of 1 Corinthians, it's not up to us. We just need to understand that this cross right here, may divide the world, but it unites us without division through the word of God, the mind of Christ. The natural man cannot receive the things of God. So when I believe this, a supernatural thing happens. That's a big word in certain circles. They want the supernatural. There's a whole program, Sid Roth, it's supernatural. And I've watched that program. I can't watch it anymore, but I used to watch it. The supernatural thing that happened to you and to me was the one baptism that is by the Spirit. The supernatural thing that happened to you and me is the circumcision that is made without hands. So we're either going to be on the natural side of the cross, or we're going to be on the supernatural side of the cross. And if that's one of your words, be on the supernatural side and understand that the supernatural things that have happened to you resulted because of this. And I didn't have to do one thing as an outward sign for an inward, outward manifestation as an inward work of grace. I didn't have to do that. This side represents death. If I'm dependent on me, I have no hope, no hope. 
represents death. This sign represents life and hope through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I put 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16 at the bottom of that. But if the natural, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. These divisions that we see today labeled as denominations or whatever, they choose a certain denomination because it appeals to a flesh side. If I want to get out of jail free, I'm going to be of Paul. If I want to be following the law, I'm going to say I'm of Apollos. And I'm going to follow a church that puts me there. If I want the miracles, signs, and wonders, I'm going to say I'm of Cephas. And I'm going to find a church that will appeal to that part of my flesh. If I want to be a red letter adherent, then I'm going to say I'm of Christ. I don't want to say that. I am in Christ, but I am a Bible believer. And that's what Paul is trying to say here. Be unified through the mind of Christ. Have fellowship in that calling. Doesn't take us away from being who we are, but it enhances who we are together in Christ. Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it is powerful. Father, we're thankful that we don't have to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Father, that we can be on the side of the cross that trusts you wholeheartedly, that knows there is nothing, nothing that we can do, nothing that we can do apart and aside from what you have already done. Father, we thank you that we do live in the abundance of your grace that the Apostle Paul penned it so perfectly for us through the Holy Spirit, Lord, that we can come into the knowledge of your truth for who we are in you. We thank you, Lord, that we can stand firm in that, not in somebody's opinion of who we are, not in somebody's thoughts of who we are, but that we can be unified by the sound doctrine that comes from the word of God. We thank you for that in Jesus' name, amen.